Hello, welcome to Irish Football Fan TV. I'm delighted to be joined by the one and only Henry Winter, and we're here to do a England versus Republic of Ireland in the Nations League preview. Henry, how are you doing this afternoon? I'm very good. Looking forward to tomorrow's game. Yeah, I've actually just been around at the train there. There seems to be a really good kind of atmosphere among the players. We know it's going to be Lee Carr's the last game um, in charge of this team. And uh, be well, before Thomas Tuchel comes in, so kind of what are you expecting from, from this England team? And, and have you been impressed by Lee Carsley throughout the, the campaign that he's had? I've been really impressed by Lee Carsley. I mean, you know, w w we all know him from way back and we all cover the under 21s. I saw the, uh, you know, the, the great win that he had and the tournament that he had with the under 21s last year. Um, I've, I've enjoyed his fresh approach promoting some of the under 21s having more mobility and pace up front having a bit more sort of imagination in his thought in uh, in central midfield angel gomez curtis jones playing curtis in a slightly different position that he plays for for liverpool one obvious aberration and a mark against him was trying to play every number 10 in the country in uh, in the game against greece at home and england rightly got found out but I felt a little bit for him after that. I mean, you'll know Lee is he's, he's a is is a he's a very decent person. I don't mean that in a patronising way. He's just a sort of proper person. He's got, you know, we, we, he's sort of seen a bit of the world and a bit of real life, which some footballers and, and haven't. So, uh, and I thought the FA put him in a difficult position. But no, he's a he's a he's a really good guy. I know he represented you forty times, and he's very proud to have done that. But he's been fantastic for. English football for the age group yeah uh, I think well a lot of Irish fans were obviously disappointed that he never became the Ireland manager when, when that opportunity came up and uh, obviously Hamer Halgrimson has come in and he's um, become the manager and he, I suppose he's, he's done alright in that sense got a couple of wins on the board which is something that Stephen Kenny kind of failed to do against nations that you would say on paper that Ireland should be beating um, so it, I suppose Ireland are kind of coming into this on a bit of a bit of a buzz and a bit of confidence because we've had so many games in the past where we thought we were going to go get a win and luck went against us a lot of the games now the luck seems to be with us obviously we know Keller made the save for the penalty and that um, I'm not expecting you to say whether you're fearful of Ireland in any way shape or form but is there, is there anyone on the Irish team who you're kind of looking at going they might cause us a problem here uh, your strikers I mean, if he plays Evan Ferguson and Sami Smodic again, we know what they can do. We've seen that in the Premier League. We've seen that in the, in the Championship, certainly with uh, Sami Smodic. Um, there's a sort of pace and a height there that, you know, the, the, the two of them, I think they'll cause England some, uh, some problems at the back. England at, at set pieces. I mean, John Pickford is coming out and sort of punching them. Um, England's attacking set pieces corners haven't been sort of that strong post Maguire so um, yeah it's, it'll be a test and you've obviously got an outstanding goalkeeper I mean you, you know you're not coming here as as underdogs I know that you, know, you might try to play that card a bit but we have so much respect for the you know the players that you've got um, you know because we see them on a regular basis um, so Engl England have got a fantastic generation of players but it's a question of balance right and question of losing the fearlessness which I think Southgate's pretty much unstitched the fearlessness or the fearfulness from the shirt but England's there's no arrogance there's none of the arrogance of the golden generation there's a I wouldn't say humility because sportsmen and women don't necessarily have that but there's a there's they won't fear the public environment but they'll absolutely respect them yeah, I think with, with, with Ireland, I don't think we go into any game not being the underdogs, to be fair. It's just the way we are and the way we've been with results probably for the last five five or six years. But, um, you know, th there just seems to be an element of this ever or sorry, this uh, England team enjoying this camp, albeit, you know, it's uh, it's Cass's last game and stuff like that. I saw the training there, uh, ground there, and there's Harry Kane, Curtis Jones, Kyle Walker. Um, Anthony Gordon, there's still some really good players in this squad. I know there's a lot of players uh, not in the squad, but I, I still feel it's a really strong England side. Is there anyone who you think maybe tomorrow could, could cause um, an impact? Well, we know obviously Harry Kane and Paul Walker, but maybe some of the maybe lesser known players. 
I mean, we say lesser known players, but, you know, we're, they're obviously sort of very well known because of their, you know, their work at club level. Take a player like Morgan Rogers, who, what, three, four years ago was was playing out in, in League One at on loan at, at Lincoln. And he's been fantastic under, well, Michael Carrick at, at Middlesbrough, when I Emery has developed them. I mean, all these players go on their own sort of personal journey. And a player like Noni Madueki has his own sort of private sort of technical coach who works with him on things. But obviously, they then have outstanding coaching at, at under 21 level, at senior level, and obviously with, the, with their clubs as well. And a, a player like Morgan Rogers has benefited from Carrick's advice. He's benefited from Unai Emery more sort of less warm but very specific technical tactical things that he will work with Morgan Rogers on so I'm looking forward to seeing Morgan he obviously came on the other night did that lovely pass inside to, to Jude Bellingham it'll be interesting to see who England play at uh, at number 10 in this game um, obviously they're missing a few of their number 10s but I think it'll be a, a balanced team and I, th- and I what I really hope is that the England fans and I'm sure they will will give Lee Carsley a great send off First, because you just look at all these under-21 players who are stepping up, and he's very much responsible for their development as people and obviously as, as players. They also step up from the under-21, a lot of them, as, as winners and champions. They know what it's like to win a trophy. But some of the senior players don't. But he should be sort of thanked for that, for their development as players and as, as winners. And also for stepping into the breach when Southgate rightly stood down. Southgate should have gone after Qatar, but that's another whole internal painful debate for the English and the FA to, to sort of work out today. But so I just hope Carsley, obviously I, you wanted to get the the win because England need to get out of this, this tier of the Nations League, but also to um, just to sort of thank him for, for what he's done because he's, he's a genuinely, genuinely likeable guy as well as a good coach. I don't think he's elite management material. Some people are... I just think the, the development work, I think he probably doesn't want the sort of the scrutiny that people like me throw at him. Um, but yeah, so anyway, I just hope he gets a good send off. Yeah, I think I kind of noticed that in the last kind of press conference that he did in the Ireland game in Dublin is that he he doesn't really, I don't, maybe he's not used to, I suppose, the media, obviously with that with the job of being the England manager, the first thing that that was was that he wouldn't sing the national anthem and that was the thing that was kind of from day one used against him but um, obviously he's won 3-0 the last night against uh, Greece do you think you know that there's going to be a bigger element of confidence now going into this game because obviously he's, he's were beaten by Greece but now the fact that yeah you, you've gotten that, that win back on your side slightly different squad of players in that game as well slightly different balance Lee Carsley is, you know, the, what happened in the first Greek game was was very disappointing. And you know, we're liking the media, and I'm as guilty of it as much as everything. They they go from heroes to heroes, to heroes within the space of a half, let alone a sort of a month. So yeah, they'll they'll come back. There'll be a buzz around the fans. It's sold out. I mean, people question international football, but you know, listening to some of your players, the passion of of putting on that that famous shirt. Um, I, I mean, I think it's it's going to be a brilliant event. I mean, the whole national anthem thing is, is ridiculous. I mean, you know, he, he can sing Haydn's Messiah before kickoff if England win. I, I, honestly, it's it was absolutely not an issue. Gary Neville didn't, you know, you could get a more sort of patriotic, stroppily patriotic individual as Gary Neville. I don't think he sang the national anthem. So the national anthem thing. If he's focused and he's in the zone, and I'm sure we'd have got a bit of poppy gate going into to this game. I imagine it's remembered and everyone will have that pop is on. He's always worn a poppy with the under twenty one. Um so yeah, it was it's not an issue. And and Thomas Tuchel should be incredibly grateful for what he Carsley's done, particularly if they do get promotion back in, particularly if it, it means there isn't a playoff in March so he can focus on the World Cup. And particularly if he looks at the like of Ashley Cole, who's the, you know, England probably England's greatest ever left back. The fact that he's now more embedded in the effort coach. Off. I hope he doesn't go back to the under-21s. I hope Ashley stays with us. But it's nice to have someone with the left foot in the uh, in the seniors. So, uh, yeah, look, Lee Parsley's amazing, amazing job, apart from the tactics against, against Greece. Um, but I think he probably knew then he wasn't going to get the job because two were already signed a few days 
four, and then he had to come out for that painful press conference with sort of idiots like me throwing questions at him. Did he want the job? And um, well, get it. So he deserves a lot of respect and gratitude. Yeah, as I say, I think a lot of the Ireland fans were very disappointed that we didn't get him. He was kind of like the, the number one target because of obviously his profile, as you said, with the under twenty ones and how um, how well he's done with them, and, and obviously bringing through players. And that's kind of th th that's kind of the road we're on now with the Irish team. A lot of the younger players are more experienced. I know Smodix has come in; and he's done well in the last couple of seasons, but he hasn't been kind of on that journey till probably last season when he's done really well at Blackburn, and then he was kind of brought in properly. But I think that's 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 kind of where we were at. That's why Carzi, I think, would have been a perfect fit. But Algramson has, in fairness to him, done quite well. What are your thoughts kind of on him, Algramson, since he's come in there since the start of this uh, Nations League? Obviously, John O'Shea was the one who kind of took the the lead on that a little bit, and then he kind of came in, and, and now he's starting to get a little bit of a, a stamp on his squad. Yeah, I mean, I, just on John O'Shea, I, I've always been incredibly impress, impressed with him, not simply as a as a player. But as a very thoughtful individual about the game, he was he was on a course at Neon, a UEFA course, and I got there early because I was giving a, a talk to some of the players. It wasn't a pro license course, but but John O'Shea was there early, being Manchester United, they're always there early, um, and just sort of talking to him and listening to him, and I just thought, God, what an impressive individual! And I sort of wished him well on his sort of coaching pathway, and you want to see players that you've admired sort of step up. Obviously, a lot of them step into the into the studio but you want to see them step into the dugout it's it's a particularly an issue that the english have in terms of gary neville obviously didn't work out when he was at valencia but you know you want these players stephen Gerrard, frank lampard we end up i mean rightly i don't have an issue with it uh with with thomas tuchel stepping in um so if, from your perspective you want to have you want to sort of develop your um you know your your, your former players and get them to sort of step up um, I don't know too much about your current coach. I mean, it was, I mean, you, you would know far better than I would. I think it sounds like it's a little bit of a score draw at the moment, whether the fans are really warm to him. But then, you know, results change everything and performances change everything. And, and that was a resilient performance the other night. And that was a, you know, it was an important performance, very good performance against the, uh, the, the, the Finns. So, yeah, but you know, you, you, got some good players i mean I, I know you'll try and spin this yarn that you're, you're coming here almost to make up the numbers you're here for you know if the crack and everything but you've got some seriously good players who are you know i was in i was in paris the night of the thierry Henry handball and i couldn't believe how obviously how hurt the players were you looked at thierry and, and richard dunn and, and players and how he behaved towards him, and how you kind of accepted it in a very sporting way. And it was so. I've always sort of thought, God, what an amazing sporting country. And then talking to Irish players, just the sort of you know, the, the, just obviously the passion for playing. So I would never write out. And if there are any sporting gods out there, you absolutely deserve a little bit of luck for what happened in Paris. I think a lot of Irish fans would love to hear that. Now, I think as fans, we definitely still hold it against Thierry Henry, uh, and I think we, we forever will. I'm sure you're probably the same with Diego Maradona. Um, but No, I don't have a problem with Maradona, because I think the second goal was just so good that you kind of accept the first goal. And in fact, if you talk to anyone, any English fan about Diego Maradona, I mean, Maradona was revered in England. You know, when he turned up, obviously before his you know, sad passing away. When Maradona turned up at like at Manchester United training, the whole place stopped. It was almost like the staff wanted to get out and see him. You know, I think we appreciate greatness in the country. Obviously, there was a frustration about, the, about what happened with the, um, you know, the, the hand of God. But when Steve Hodge put the shirt, the Maradona shirt from that game up for auction, I went to the auctioneers and I had to give a talk. The room was absolutely packed. And it wasn't just football fans. It was a the collectors and it went for like sort of six million and that is a reflection of how i mean maradona is a top three players of all time you know so anyway i mean just just that's just an english thing on maradona and that's not just he i think a lot of maradona is is revered in england so yeah we've forgiven him the hand of god
Um, I, I, I still don't think uh, I, I appreciate Thierry Henry is, is was a great player and probably one of the best if not the best in the Premier League as well but I, I, I'll still always hold it against him I'm sure there's plenty of Irish fans that would as well but I, I would forgive Mar- Maradona to be fair um, just a word on Thomas Tuchel coming in what, what are you kind of expecting on him and you know what was your initial thoughts on, on the appointment you've probably already uh, spoken about it well I've always been a a huge admirer and supporter of St George's Park, £120 million development centre. Everyone sees it as the England Players Hub, but really it's a coaching hub if you go there on sort of, you know, when the squads aren't there. And it's really important that England and the FA develop our own coaches. But that said, if, if the FA, for some inexplicable reason, isn't going to approach Newcastle United and Eddie Howe, whether they thought they were, the compensation was too much, whether they didn't want to get into a fight with Saudi lawyers, whatever, uh, Eddie Howe was the only one who I thought of the quality, uh, homegrown in inverted commas, who, who could have stepped up. So they then went for the, the well, they went for the best available, which was, which was Thomas Tuchel. So I didn't have a problem with that. And the whole sort of, German thing, and I know the media have written a lot about it. If it had been if it had been Jurgen Klopp appointed, all the all the newspapers which have been critical about him, and the media generally, it's not just the newspapers, and all the phone-ins which have been frothing with in, indignation and where's the bulldog spirit and Churchill will be turning in his grave and all that stuff. You know, if it had been Klopp, everyone would go, wow, you know, Klopp. You know, because he's such a legend over here. But look, Tuchel won the Champions League. He knows players like Harry Kane. Chelsea or connections. So, and the fact is, what the FA's done is basically it is a performance related, you know, he's basically got 18. Everyone over the years of her, it's coming up to the 60th anniversary. You probably know we're a bit obsessed still about 66. Um, so it'd be quite enough. I mean, I've written a book on it, and I mean, it was just, <laughs> it'd be nice to update it. And that was 10 years ago. There should be a big clock over Wembley with with just sort of with the lengthening years of hurt. Uh, we we are obsessed with it, not not out of a sort of sense of entitlement, but just a sort of a look at the quality of players that England have. Whether it was a golden generation, whether it was the eighties, whether it was the seventies, when England had some amazing entertainers and didn't qualify for two World Cups. I know this might sound like first world problems, but England got some exceptional players. I, I will put this generation of players in terms of the depth and the quality and the Champions League winners and the, you know, I vote on the Ballon d'Or and they were, what, two or three players who were in there. Drew Bellingham was in there. Phil Foden was in there. Harry Kane. I mean, the, you know, Eng- England had three players in the top 10 in the Ballon d'Or. Which is, so the quality is there. Um, so I think that is, so it's not a sense of entitlement. Everyone gets the, the Three Lions um, song completely wrong. It's a sort of, not entitlement, but a, just a sort of desire for this collection of players who are pretty pretty decent bunch on the whole as individuals as well as exceptional players and think, wow, someone's got to organise them. Thomas Tuchel can, can do that. We've seen him do that. We've seen him do that in the Champions League. And, you know, and, and good luck to him. Yeah, I'm just thinking when you said there about having three players in the top ten Ballon d'Or and you're comparing our Irish team to that. We, I don't think we have one in the top 50 at the moment, which I'm hoping obviously that will... Well, that, Kelleher might be in that debate, but he needs, in my opinion, to, to go to a place somewhere, uh, um, I suppose, as, as a first-team keeper. What are your, what are your thoughts on, on Quivian, actually, just before I finish up? I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of him, and I think he's an outstanding goalkeeper, and as you said, he needs to move on. I mean, it's... You know, it's it's frustrating, but Allison's got another sort of two, three years in him. I mean, Kelleher's what twenty six. I think he's around sort of twenty five, twenty two. Yeah, so and you know, oh, okay, so he's a goalkeeper, and you look at Emmy Martinez, who had his sort of years, not so much in the wilderness, but it took him a bit of time, and now he's winning the Ashen Trophy in the Ballon d'Or uh, and winning major tournaments. So you know, good things come to to those, particularly goalkeepers, slightly later. You know. In, in their sort of their aging process. But I just think he is just so good. I mean, if you look, so he would get into Chelsea's first team, absolutely 100%. He wouldn't get into Manchester City's first team. It would be touch and go with David Ware, with Arsenal. He would 100% get into Tom Hotspur's first team. And then obviously all the others. I'm at Pickford. I'm in Everton. I'm in, 
I mean, Liverpool fans would obviously say Kelleher were getting there ahead. But basically, if you just remove, say, four clubs in the Premier League, all other 16, he would get to. So he, he is he is that he is that good, and I hope I hope he does go for his benefit, for the benefit of the club he's going to, for the Republic of Ireland's benefit, um, because you know Liverpool have got well, effectively so they'll have four outstanding. So yeah, he needs you know he needs to move, and I bet he is conflicted because people fall in love with Liverpool. I think he's came out though and said that in the last international camp or, or the one previous to that is that he did he did want to basically move on to first team football although he does love the cup. Just one other player actually as well. Just one one other topic because again you, you you'll see a lot of Premier League football and up close and personal. What are your thoughts on, on Evan Ferguson? You mentioned him earlier on in the uh, start of of this preview, but how impressed have you been by him and, and what do you think maybe his ceiling could be? I don't think there is a ceiling with Evan Ferguson and I think if there was he would head his way through it I think he's outstanding when he broke through at Brighton then he had this sort of bit of a dip a bit of an injury but I was remember when he did have his first couple of games for for Brighton I was talking to Paul Barber the chief executive there and I think Liam Brady was is one of his neighbours I don't know if, if Liam's still living down in in Brighton or in that he area was, but anyway, I, for sure yeah oh okay well I, I think they were all I mean I think they were in Hove and Hove's a, a, a lovely part of the of, of the south coast and I think they've been talking and Liam Brady have been raving about him and just said this you know and Brady's a fantastic judge of talent not simply because he was an exceptional player but Liam Brady as Arsenal fans will tell you was an exceptional developer of, of footballing talent uh, in Arsenal's academy so uh, I, I think he's got pretty much everything it, it, it I mean maybe he had got lightning pace but you know what he's still he still can cover the ground he's an intelligent player as a lot of the bright players are he'd be fantastically well coached he's obviously a handful physically but it's funny because at the start of the season everyone was saying where are all the number nines got obviously Erling Haaland's you know outstanding but where are the number nines and then Dominic Solanke started playing well and someone who I'm sure you would love to have in in, in your squad um, Liam Delat Rory's son um, has been I've been outstanding for the under 21s increasingly for, for Ipswich and suddenly there are all these number um, number nines around and Evan Ferguson sort of comes back into the uh, in, into the fray so everything you know you talk to people at Brighton they say the first thing they say is a really good lad you know really good professional absolutely focused so that's you know, that's important he's got the ability it was just availability you know just making sure that he was fit and ready and yeah he will cause England problems absolutely 100% I think that's where Ireland fans were at with him. It's just the fact that he kept getting bad injuries uh, at times when we were expecting him being off the, the back of really good form at Brighton and then he's got an injury and he missed the international break. So this is the first time we've seen him probably fit and I think he came out after the game the other night and said this is the best shape he's been in. So hopefully we'll start to see that kind of sharpness of him back. You probably won't want to see that considering you're obviously spot in England. But um, from our point of view, like he, he is the one that we kind of look to Maybe it's a little bit harsh considering how young he is, but we haven't had a whole lot to shout about in so long. Um, but just on the just to finish up, we usually just do a kind of score prediction. So how do you see the game going? What score do you think it might be? Two one England, but it, it won't be easy, and it'll be a fantastic atmosphere because your fans, I mean your mobile party. I can remember 2002 at the World Cup going out just for sort of you know, a bit of journalistic research and ending up in a bar somewhere. And I don't think it was Tokyo, but it was just one place. It was one of those strange bars where you go up in a lift about six floors and there, were, there was a sort of splash of green shirts one end of the bar. And then I'm pretty sure it was Saudi Arabian fans at the other end of the bar. And one round was like 10 Guinness, pints of Guinness. And the other round was 10 Dark Cokes. And then I, mean, I was just was sitting with some friends and just having a sort of drink in the middle of it. And within an hour, no, but less than that, everyone was in together, you know, the Irish room, the Saudis. And it was, it was just fantastic. And it's what sport should be about. It should be about everyone sort of mingling. And, and you just saw the rounds were going in, you know, five dark, five Guinness, you know, and then it would be someone else's turn to get them. And it was brilliant. I might have completely misread that because Japan was still a bit of a blur. A good time is had by all. But look, your your fans are fantastic. 
And I think it's only appropriate that I talk to you in a pub and that you're surrounded by happy people because that's what I associate with with your sporting teams. I mean, just one final thing. I was in, I was at um, Lansdowne Road in '95, and but up to disgrace. And I remember going into a bar on the way back to. We got a late flight out with England and going into a sort of bar just to do some work. And just the barman was apologising. And I said, why, why are you apologising? It was England fans. It was a right-wing, well-organised of England fans, absolutely disgracing the shirt and the country. And he said, oh, no, it's just one of those things. And I just thought, well, fair play, because you could have, you know, you could have barred me from coming into the place. So for me, you are the number one sporting nation. I mean that in the, the, the sporting sense, um, as well as the sort of you know the the athletic ability of your rugby players and all the other sports that you 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 play, but um, yeah. So look, the atmosphere will be fantastic, and um, I hope there's no booing of the anthems. You can never really tell with England fans, but anyway, we'll, uh, we'll we'll see. But it'll be it'll be a good game. But I'm going two one England. Well, yeah, I think you, you summed it up perfectly there. Best fans in the world, as we're known. Um, but the yeah, the, the booing of the, the national anthem, I think that needs to not be done. By, I mean, the FAI just got fined for it there uh, a couple of weeks ago. For fines, are, fines are absolutely irrelevant. And I mean, I imagine you very rarely get fined for your fans' behaviour. But for, I've been covering it many years with uh, with England fans and fines. Fines are, fines are stupid. If Harry Kane had any sense of the spot, he would come out and say, please don't boo because it does not help the team. It just winds up the opposition. Yeah, exactly. And I, I actually wouldn't be surprised if he does say that. He obviously can come out and he's quite cool, calm and collected. But um, Henry, I, I've taken up 25 minutes or, or longer of your time. Um, I just want to, to end it. Um, you want to let the viewers know where they can find you or where they can find your articles or anything like that. So... Oh, oh, don't worry about that. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, well, I'm on Twitter. I'm, on, I'm all over the place. But I'll be at the match tomorrow, so I look forward to catching up with you there. Yeah, well, 100%. Well, listen, thanks so much for your time again. Sorry pleasure. if I've uh, held you on too long, but uh, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, having you on, and you've been brilliant, so thanks so much. My pleasure. Cheers. All right. Uh, just end the recording. Yeah, that's perfect.